weekly seminar in, uh, hist on historical perspectives on international and national affairs. Great to see everybody back uh, for uh, this first uh, seminar in the spring. Um, as you've seen from the flyers outside, we have, a, a, I think, a wonderful program lined up uh, uh, for everyone, and I, uh, both Roger Lewis, my co-chair, and I hope that uh, you will join us as uh, many times as you can, as regularly as you can. Uh, let me say that this seminar, as always, is co-sponsored by the National History Center, an initiative of the American Historical Association, and the Woodrow Wilson Center, where I direct the History and Public Policy Program. Of course, uh, Roger Lewis, um, my co-chair, directs the National History Center, and we want, we would like to acknowledge uh, the support of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations uh, for some of the expenses involved in um, organizing this event. Um, we're delighted today to start off the series with a talk by Professor Kevin Kenny on Abram Lincoln, Abram Lincoln and the Irish. Um, professor Kenny is professor of history at Boston College, where he teaches courses on American immigration, global migration, and general U.S. history. He's currently writing a book on the concept of diaspora and researching a project on the significance of immigration as a theme in American history from the colonial era, era to the present. He has uh, held a number of uh, p uh, academic positions and has uh, a good number of um, books to his credit. Let me just mention that he's taught at City University of New York, Columbia University, and at the University of Texas, Austin. He is the author of Peaceable Kingdom Lost, The Paxton Boys, and William Penn's Holy Experiment, The Irish Towards the USA, as well as The American Irish History, and Making Sense of the Molly Maguires. He's the editor of Ireland and the British Empire, the Oxford History of the British Empire Companion Series. And he has published uh, numerous articles in some of the leading journals in the field. He holds a PhD in American history from Columbia University, and uh, we're thrilled to have him here today as our inaug uh, 2012 inaugural speaker. Um, before I turn it over uh, to Professor Kenny. Let me uh, uh, ask Roger to uh, make some introductory remarks as well. Uh, well, I'll just say very briefly that I have arrived this afternoon from Austin, Texas, via Dallas-Fort Worth, via Pittsburgh, uh, which I mentioned we were put down in Pittsburgh because of the weather at uh, the Reagan National Airport. I mention that only because I was determined that nothing would prevent me from hearing <laughs> Kevin Kenny on Abraham Lincoln and the Irish. I have followed uh, Kevin Kenny's work uh, since his first book on the Molly Maguires and have watched him gradually emerge to the status as one of the foremost uh, historians of Ireland, uh, not only in this country, but throughout the, uh, the world. Uh, before we uh, turn it over to Kevin, could we just go around the room and let people identify themselves briefly? If, if, yes, please, if you could wait for the microphone, otherwise the folks um, watching us on webcast won't be able to hear They will you. never know who you are. Exactly. Anita Jones, Director Emerita from the American Historical Association. I'm Deirdre Burke from the Irish Embassy here. Kevin Maloney, I'm the Director of Licensing, Defense Trade Controls, Department of State. Jan Sher, visiting for the first time. I'm Tyler Anbinder from the History Department at George Washington University. I'm Andrew Zimmerman, also from the History Department at George Washington University. I'm Mickey Fabry. Um, I teach international relations at Georgia Tech, and I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center this year. I'm Megan Myers, and I teach at George Mason. Landis Jones, uh, Emeritus, University of Louisville. Al Milliken, AM Media. Bill Milam, I'm a senior scholar here at the Wilson Center. Robert Mahoney, uh, emeritus from Cosmic University. 
Adrian Steffen, retired State Department. Robert Baum, a fellow at the Wilson Center, and I normally teach at the University of Missouri, Columbia. I'm uh, Steve Nutting, and I'm in the Coast Guard. Christine Kelly, I'm a student at George Washington University. Corey Caldwell, and I'm a student at American University. Hi, I'm Holly Hassett. I'm on the board of directors of the Washington Ireland Program for Service and Leadership. Kristen Leary, I'm also on the board of directors of the Washington Ireland Program for Service and Leadership. I'm also the U.S. director of the Frederick Douglass Daniel O'Connell Project. Joe Freeman, also a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Marion Barber from the National History Center. I'm Paul Belford. I guess I'm visiting. I'm Kenton Clymer. I'm a fellow here at the Center and also at Northern Illinois University. Stephen Shore, I'm visiting. Ross Johnson, Wilson Center, senior scholar. Dick Arndt, retired cultural diplomat. And let us introduce, let us turn to Kevin Kenny, Abraham Lincoln, and the Irish. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, um, Roger and uh, uh, Christian. Christian. Um, I also uh, wanted to, to thank um, Deirdre Burke for um, coming over from the embassy and uh, Tyler and Binder from George Washington, and of course to uh, all of you for turning out in, in, in this weather. So the talk I, I'm giving today, uh, firstly, can, can you hear me, everybody? It's a it's very long, narrow table. It's odd to be uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sitting here from this angle. The, the talk I'm giving today is, is part of a collaborative project among historians investigating Abraham Lincoln's image around the world. And the result of this project is a book, The Global Lincoln, uh, published uh, a couple of months ago by Oxford University Press, which includes essays on Lincoln's significance in England, Scotland, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, India, Latin America, East Asia, and Africa. So when the project editors, uh, Richard Carwardine and Jay Sexton, asked me to write the chapter on Lincoln and the Irish, uh, my response uh, was a mixture of pleasure, bafflement, and skepticism. I was pleased uh, to be asked, as the project sounded new and exciting. I was baffled because, to my knowledge, nobody had written anything on that topic before. That's Lincoln's image in Ireland. Um, and I was skeptical, obviously, because the lack of previous work uh, strongly suggested that there wouldn't be much to say. So I told Richard and Jay that their idea was either a very good one or a very bad one, um, that I would need a few months of preliminary work uh, to decide one way or the other. But to my surprise, I quickly found quite a lot of material about Lincoln and the Irish, uh, which I will be sharing with you today. I did not find this material, however, in the places where I first looked. As a specialist in 19th century US history and Atlantic migration, I initially thought my inquiry would concentrate mainly or even exclusively on Lincoln's interactions with the American Irish in the 1850s and 1860s and on Irish-American memories of Lincoln thereafter. But I found very little about that in the sources. The Irish, as Lincoln was well aware, were the largest immigrant group in the United States in the 1840s, and the second largest after the Germans in the 1850s. But what he had to say about the Irish in particular was a subset of his larger concerns with immigration and slavery. Immigration paled by comparison with slavery in Lincoln's thinking, but the two questions were always interconnected. Lincoln knew that immigrants came to the United States in search of independence and social mobility, and that they were a source of economic prosperity, essential tenets of his political creed. He hoped that by settling in the West, they might serve as an obstacle to the expansion of slavery. And connections between anti-immigrant nativism and anti-slavery sentiment 
as Tyler Randbinder has demonstrated, were central to the political crisis of the 1850s, which gave rise to the Republican Party. Lincoln's thinking on these questions developed in subtle and significant ways over the course of his political career from a calculated circumspection about nativism and a guarded defense of immigrants' rights in the 1850s to an open embrace of the benefits of immigration during the Civil War. But this is all the subject of another lecture, uh, one which I may uh, come back to Washington to deliver later this year. But my research for the, Globe and the Global Lincoln Project uh, took me in a quite new and unexpected direction. It allowed me to examine Lincoln's significance not in Irish American history, but in the history of Ireland itself. And that is my subject this afternoon. Now, in retrospect, I can see that I ought not to have been quite so surprised by this development as I initially was. After all, the history of Ireland and the United States, broadly conceived, share some fundamental themes. These include the idea of a constitutional union, the legitimacy of secession, or in the Irish idiom, partition, the qualities of political leadership during times of war, and the brutal realities of civil war. Noticeably absent from this list is slavery. Irish political leaders who invoked Lincoln did sometimes associate national liberation with emancipation. But the link was always tenuous, even on a rhetorical level. Lincoln freed the slaves in order to keep a nation free, not in order to liberate a nation from colonial rule. Much more important than slavery in determining the Irish image of Abraham Lincoln were questions concerning national freedom and unity, partition, and civil war especially in the critical period of political upheaval in Irish history that began in the 1880s and subsided in the 1920s. Lincoln's posthumous image took shape in Ireland in a context defined by union a constitutional arrangement that existed in varying forms on both sides of the English-speaking Atlantic world. Lincoln's purpose when he went to war was to preserve the union of the American states. Ireland, too, was part of a union. The entire island between 1801 and 1921 and six northern counties thereafter belonged to a united kingdom that included England, Scotland, and Wales. Some Irishmen were prepared to fight to maintain this Anglo-Irish Union, which they regarded as the foundation of their identity. <clears throat> Others gave up their lives in an effort to destroy it. Irish Unionists cited Lincoln in their effort to preserve the United Kingdom, denying that Irish nationalists had the right to local autonomy, let alone independence. But Irish nationalists also invoked Lincoln to justify their belief in a free and united Ireland from which Protestant Ulster would have no right to secede. The dominant moderate faction of Irish nationalists called for legislative autonomy or home rule under the crown and within the empire. A radical Republican minority wanted a full-fledged united Irish Republic achieved through force of arms, if necessary. All sides to the Irish question, from British government officials and unionists to moderate nationalists and hardline Republicans, found occasion to invoke Abraham Lincoln, demonstrating that utility rather than consistency is the hallmark of politically effective historical memory. Comparisons between the American and the Anglo-Irish unions first came to the fore during the Home Rule Crisis of the 1880s. Invariably, these comparisons were designed to defend the United Kingdom and the British Empire against the perceived threat of Irish nationalism, with Abraham Lincoln cast in the role of savior of the union. These comparisons were often somewhat strained 
given that the American Union was federal in structure and the British-Irish Union was a centralized unitary state. The American states, moreover, had joined their union voluntarily, while most Irish nationalists believed that the Irish had not. <clears throat> Supporters of home rule insisted that modifying the union by giving legislative autonomy to Ireland posed no threat to British or imperial unity. The Irish would manage domestic affairs, but Westminster would continue to control finance, taxation, and defense. But their unionist opponents, who included an influential segment of the British and Irish ruling classes, saw home rule as a direct threat to the union and the empire. In their decades-long campaign to prevent Irish autonomy and later independence, the unionists turned repeatedly to Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War. Analogies between the United Kingdom and Lincoln's United States emerged forcefully in 1886 when Prime Minister William Gladstone declared his support for Irish home rule. Pointing to Gladstone's initial support for the Confederacy, his critics argued that Irish autonomy would be a precursor to secession. The Prime Minister's foremost opponent within the Liberal Party, Joseph Chamberlain, declared in the House of Commons that Gladstone had once, quote, counseled the disintegration of the United States, end quote, and predicted that the inevitable outcome of home rule would be separation followed by a civil war within the United Kingdom. I say to Ireland what the Liberals or Republicans of the North said to the southern states of America, Chamberlain announced, the union must be preserved. For Chamberlain, this was the principle Lincoln had stood for above all else. Convinced that Ireland's geographical proximity and strategic importance to England ruled out any possibility of home rule, Chamberlain and his followers justified their position by insisting that the Irish were unfit for self-rule. As the liberal unionist Godwin Smith put it in a letter to an American friend in 1886, mm. you fought for your union against slavery. We are fighting for ours against savagery and superstition. As positions hardened on Irish home rule in the coming decades, the American Union became a flexible metaphor for the British Union, despite the considerable differences between the two. And Lincoln's actions during the Civil War became a potential model for preserving the United Kingdom against the threats of Irish nationalism. When a second, more protracted home rule crisis began in 1910, the image of Abraham Lincoln assumed its most prominent form in Irish history. On December 26, 1910, the leading Irish Unionist newspaper, the Irish Times, enthusiastically endorsed an appeal to Ulster, recently published in The Spectator magazine. Seeking to counter Republican nationalist claims that Ireland was, quote, an indivisible unit and cannot in any circumstances be separated, end quote, the appeal had quoted a well-known passage from Lincoln. By what right, Lincoln had demanded to know, did a state presume to rule all which is less than itself and ruin all which is larger than itself? What mysterious right to play a tyrant is conferred on a district of a country by merely calling it a state? These questions, according to the Irish Times, contain Ulster's case in a nutshell. An Irish home rule state, the newspaper predicted, would seek on the one hand to absorb the smaller entity of Ulster and on the other hand to disrupt the larger entity of which it was but one integral part, the United Kingdom. Ronald McNeil, the unionist, unionist MP for East Kent, cited Lincoln's example along similar lines at a magnificent Dublin meeting in the Theatre Royal in 1913. McNeil attacked Prime Minister Herbert Asquith for insisting that further refusal to grant autonomy to Ireland after so many general election majorities in Ireland in favor of home rule would be a negation of democratic government. 
turning to Lincoln and the American Civil War to refute the idea that a given region within a union could leave of its own volition, MacNeill declared that this was not the opinion of one of the greatest democratic statesmen that ever lived. Lincoln had been prepared to fight to the last in the greatest civil war the world had ever known rather than concede the demand put forward by a large minority of his countrymen. Rather than allowing secession or disunion, Lincoln was willing to face civil war. Asquith, by contrast, was willing to run the risk of civil war in our country not to prevent disunion, but to force it upon those who do not want it. Like Lincoln, MacNeill continued, Ulster Unionist leaders were prepared to use force to counter the threat of secession. But Lincoln had the law at his back, whereas the Unionists were called upon to resist technically legal authority, in other words, British law, in the name of the higher good of preserving the United Kingdom. The Ulster Rebellion, MacNeill continued, was based on resistance to the transfer of a people's allegiance without their consent, to their forcible expulsion from a constitution with which they were content, and their forcible inclusion in a constitution which they detested. Thus, whereas Lincoln took up arms to resist secession, Ulster Unionists did so to resist expulsion. Critically, however, the purpose in both cases, MacNeill concluded, was to preserve union. On Easter Monday, 1916, a small group of radical Republicans in the distinctively Irish sense of that word, not in the American sense, launched an insurrection in Dublin. They declared an Irish Republic and for the next five years led a guerrilla war against Britain to secure the independence of that republic. Britain had no intention of recognizing a full-fledged Irish Republic, especially one that fulfilled the worst nightmares of the Unionists by claiming sovereignty over the whole island of Ireland. Some form of local autonomy through home rule remained the preferred option. In December 1920, the British Parliament passed the Government of Ireland Act, establishing two separate Irish parliaments. One for six heavily Protestant counties in Ulster, the other for the remaining 26 counties in the south of Ireland. Ulster Unionists, who had initially resisted home rule in any form, accepted their own locally autonomous legislature as a counterweight to the body that was supposed to meet in Dublin. The Parliament of Northern Ireland duly came into being in June 1921. But Home Rule came too late for the self-constituted Irish Republic, presided over by Eamon de Valera, who had participated in the Easter Rising in 1916 and had no intention of accepting mere autonomy within the Union. Accordingly, the representatives elected in the other 26 counties of Ireland constituted themselves not as an autonomous home rule parliament within the United Kingdom, but as the second Dáil Éireann, successor to the sovereign but unrecognized parliament of the Irish Republic declared by armed force in 1916 and democratically elected in 1918. Now, during this period of violence, negotiation, and political redefinition between the Easter Rising of 1916 and the outbreak of an Irish civil war in 1922, Abraham Lincoln loomed larger than ever before or since in Irish history. The two dominant figures on the Anglo-Irish stage during this period, Eamon de Valera, and David Lloyd George, both fervently admired Lincoln, but for quite different reasons. 
Lloyd George invoked Lincoln to defend the union of Britain and Ireland. De Valera did so in an effort to destroy that union and replace it with the United Ireland, whose legitimacy he believed transcended all attempts to limit national sovereignty. When either de Valera or Lloyd, jo Lloyd George talked about Lincoln, he was inevitably talking to a large extent about himself. Lloyd George celebrated Lincoln as a great wartime executive who had preserved freedom by prevailing over the forces of reaction, just as he himself had done during World War I. Speaking at the unveiling of a statue in Westminster in 1920, the British Prime Minister cited Lincoln's chief characteristics as courage, fortitude, patience, humanity, and clemency. Resolute in war, he was moderate in victory, the Prime Minister declared. Misrepresented, misunderstood, underestimated, he was patient to the last, much like George, Lloyd George uh, in his self-estimation. De Valera, by contrast, admired Lincoln for preventing the permanent partition of the United States, just as he himself intended to do in Ireland. Reflecting in 1933 on the political carnage in Ireland a decade earlier, he praised in Lincoln not only the love of truth, which through all the vicissitudes of life inspired him, but also the confidence in the ultimate triumph of right, which upheld him in the darkest years of the Civil War. And that was de Valera's self-referential um, assessment of Lincoln after the Irish Civil War. Born in New York City in 1882, de Valera made a crucial visit to the United States as head of the de facto Irish Republic in 1919 and 1920, and always identified closely with the American political tradition, whatever that might be, um, uh, the tradition that he chose it to be. According to an American Secret Service agent who visited de Valera when he was serving as Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister during World War II, a large reproduction of the Lincoln Memorial Statue of Lincoln and framed reproductions of the Declaration of Independence dominate the reception room next to his office. De Valera also reportedly kept a bust of Lincoln on his desk. Although there's, scarce, there's scarcely a political leader in the book, The Global Lincoln, who was not reported to have kept a bust of Lincoln on his desk. Uh, <laughs> um, in July 1921, um, when the British offered Southern Ireland the status of a self-governing dominion subject to external control over Irish defense, trade, and finance, in other words, home rule, de Valera rejected the offer in a manner that turned Lloyd George's understanding of Lincoln on its head. Citing Lincoln, Lloyd George had insisted that no British government could acknowledge Ireland's right to secede from her allegiance to the king. De Valera, however, had a strong counter-argument. Ireland, he insisted, had no such allegiance to yield. We are not claiming any right to secede, he declared in 1921. There never can be, in the case of Ireland, a question of secession because there never has been a union. The Dublin Freeman's Journal made a similar argument. Mr. Lloyd George reiterates the analogy he has so frequently drawn between Ireland and the southern states of America during the Civil War. But Ireland had never agreed to a union with Great Britain. The union was imposed, not chosen, and hence it was invalid. There could be no question of secession from a position never occupied. The Confederate states had voluntarily accepted and acquiesced in the union of the American states, and hence the word secession may rightly be applied to their case. But Ireland could not secede from a union of which it had never legitimately been a part. It followed that the true secessionists in the Irish case were not the Irish nationalists, but the unionist residents of Northeast Ulster who wished to secede from the Irish nation. They had no more right to do so from an Irish nationalist point of view than American Southerners had in 1861. Responding to de Valera that his government was profoundly disappointed 
by his characterization of the Anglo-Irish Union, Lloyd George quoted Lincoln's first inaugural address to support his case. I cannot better express the British standpoint in this respect, the Prime Minister wrote in 1921, than in the words used of the northern and southern states by Abraham Lincoln in his first inaugural address. They were spoken by him on the brink of the American Civil War, which he was striving to avert. Physically speaking, Lincoln had told the South, we cannot separate, we cannot remove our respective sections from each other, nor build an impassable wall between them. Lincoln warned Southerners that you, can, you cannot fight always, and when, after much loss on both sides and no gain on either, you cease fighting, the identical old questions as to terms of intercourse are again upon you. It could not be reasonably contended, Lloyd George insisted, that the relations of Great Britain and Ireland are in any different case. Britain would discuss no settlement which involves a refusal on the part of Ireland to accept our invitation to free, equal and loyal partnership in the British Commonwealth under one sovereign. Exchanging diplomatic notes was no longer sufficient, Lloyd George warned. Immediate progress was necessary if the truce was to be maintained. Otherwise, like Lincoln in 1861, he would unleash war on the secessionists. When representatives of the Irish and British governments signed the Articles of Agreement for a Treaty on December 6, 1921, the nationalist government in Dublin split. The treaty gave Southern Ireland the equivalent of self-governing dominion status within the Commonwealth, but it required members of the Irish Parliament to swear an oath of allegiance, not just to the Irish Free State, but also to the British monarch, and it endorsed the partition of Ireland. Although many seasoned Republicans urged that the treaty be accepted on pragmatic grounds, de Valera balked at the requirement that Irish elected officials swear an oath of allegiance to the British Crown. He continued to insist, first, that Ireland would associate with the Commonwealth only on a voluntary basis as a sovereign independent state, and second, that no part of Ireland could exclude itself from the national territory. When the Irish Parliament met to vote on the treaty in the first week of January 1922, de Valera quoted from the Gettysburg Address. Now I stand here as one who believes in ordered government, the president of the de facto Irish Republic began. I believe fundamentally in the right of the Irish people to govern themselves. I believe fundamentally in the government, excuse, that's a bad line to flub. Uh, I believe fundamentally in government of the people, by the people, and if I may add the other part, for the people. That is my fundamental creed. Supporters of the treaty, however, sharply criticized the limitations of de Valera's democratic creed, quoting Lincoln in an impassioned defense of the treaty and the principle of democratic majority rule. If representative government is going to remain on earth, then a representative must voice the opinion of his constituents, the founder of Sinn Féin, Arthur Griffith, declared. And if his conscience will not let him do that, he has only one way out, and that is to resign and refuse to misrepresent them. For a member of the Irish Parliament to vote against the treaty when his constituents supported it, Griffith insisted, is the negation of all democratic right. It is, it is the negation of all freedom. Tactics of this sort, he warned, would kill Irish democracy at birth. When de Valera had visited America in 1919, Griffith continued, he had honored the memory of Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln's words are words I recommend to you now. During an election campaign in 1836, Griffith explained, Lincoln had promised, if elected, I shall consider the whole people of the constituency in question my constituents, as well those who oppose me as those who support me. While acting as their representative, I shall be governed by their will on all such subjects on which I have the means of knowing what that will is. Irish representatives ought to adopt the same principle, Griffith <coughs> concluded, and if they did so, none could go down to his constituency and stand on a platform before his people 
and say he is against this treaty. Griffith dodged the question of what a representative ought to do in a constituency where most voters opposed the treaty. But his overall point, that majority rule was essential to the functioning of democracy, though not entirely persuasive in its formulation, came close to the heart of Lincoln's political vision. As early as 1861, Lincoln told his secretary, John Hay, that the central idea in the Civil War was to prove that popular government is not an absurdity. Americans must settle the question whether in a free government the minority have the right to break up the government whenever they choose. If we fail, it will go far to prove the incapability of the people to govern themselves. Griffith made the same point in May 1922 with Ireland on the brink of civil war. There was nothing more insolent in the history of this country or in the history of modern civilization than the claim that any body of men or any minority of this country should tell the Irish people that they have no right to decide upon an issue which affects their whole future and affects the destiny of the country. On the Republican side, among the most uncompromising voices was Mary McSweeney, whose brother Terence had recently died on hunger strike. McSweeney conjured up quite a different Abraham Lincoln from Arthur Griffith's version in her argument against compromise. We stand for the preservation of the existing republic, which exists in consequence of the Declaration of Independence of 1916, no matter how much the deputies who have forsworn it may choose to sneer at it, she declared in Dáil Éireann in May 1922. And any action that we have taken, we have taken on that basis and that basis alone. The Republican movement had not been bluffing in 1916, and it was not bluffing now, no matter what the consequences may be. Did her opponents really think the treaty was worth civil war, she asked? They could, they could only answer her by asking another question. Is the Republic, is the independence of Ireland worth civil war? To this question, McSweeney answered yes, a thousand times yes, it is worth civil war. The unity and independence of Ireland are as much worth civil war to Ireland as the unity of the United States was worth civil war to Abraham Lincoln. Ironically, McSweeney's Lincoln, the intransigent wartime leader, was closer to Lloyd George's than to Arthur Griffith's. But McSweeney's sleight of hand in coupling the word independence with unity cast Lincoln in the unlikely role of nationalist liberator, an image that persisted in Irish Republican circles for several decades. Although Lincoln had some sympathy with Irish and Hungarian nationalism early in his career, he was never a national freedom fighter of the type Irish Republicans had in mind. The pro-treaty side was closer to Lincoln's spirit in emphasizing the underlying principle that made unity worth fighting for in the first place, majority rule as the essence of democracy. Yet, from the all-Ireland perspective of anti-treaty Republicans, the plea for majority rule was itself fatally flawed. De Valera and McSweeney saw Ireland as a unified entity and cited Lincoln in insisting that the unionist minority in Northeast Ulster had no right to dictate terms to the majority on the rest of the island, let alone to sever their connection with Ireland. Unable to reach agreement on questions of sovereignty, partition, and the nature of political democracy, the Irish pro-treaty and anti-treaty forces duly went to war in June 1922. The pro-treaty side prevailed in the Civil War, and in the Irish free state that emerged on the partitioned island of Ireland as a result, Eamon de Valera spent most of the next decade in the political wilderness before re-emerging as the <coughs> dominant figure in Irish history. Now, the treaty had made vague assurances that a boundary commission would um, meet to settle the borders between the two states that had now emerged on the island, Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State. Supporters of the treaty in 1922 had apparently hoped that the Boundary Commission would redraw the borders in such a way that Northern Ireland would be reduced to an unviable rump. 
In actual fact, when the Boundary Commission met in 1925, uh, it became clear that it intended to transfer parts of the Irish Free State into Northern Ireland um, and the makings of another political crisis were there. Eamon de Valera, languishing on the sidelines after the defeat of the Republican side, seized the opportunity to condemn the treaty, the Free State, and the partition of Ireland. Again, um, the theme being that no section north or south, east or west of the country uh, could constitutionally um, uh, secede from the country. The southern states of the American Union had a far better case for secession than our northern unionists, de Valera insisted, and President Lincoln faced four years of civil war rather than permitted. The, res the resolution of the Boundary Commission was an intergovernmental inter agreement to shut it down before it did any more harm. So the um, findings of the Boundary Commission were never implemented. The governments agreed that it, it, it should disband, to which um, Lincoln once again responded, this time in, in words that Link, the, excuse me, De Valera responded in words that Lincoln surely would have recognized. Uh, we deny that any section of our people can give away the sovereignty or alienate any part of the nation's territory. De Valera returned to power in the 1930s, uh, forming three governments, and thereafter had a national and international platform from which to publicize the problem of uh, partition. To give one example, it is a great privilege to be able to address American friends on this Lincoln's birthday, he declared in a radio broadcast to the American people in 1933. The veneration in which Abraham Lincoln is held by the American people is shared in no small, small measure by the people of Ireland. Having ourselves so long striven for freedom, we honor him as the liberator of a race. Now, the language, again, is interesting, and the sleight of hand, I, I think, in the language. Like Mary McSweeney, de Valera moved seamlessly from emancipation of the slaves to national freedom and unity, conflating the liberation of the slaves with the liberation of the Irish um, from the continuing effects of British colonial rule. De Valera, in that same speech, uh, denounced um, partition of Ireland as the worst of all the many crimes committed by British statesmen against the Irish people during the last 750 years. Uh, it's radio rhetoric, but it also, I think, uh, does indicate um, starkly different understandings of nationality uh, on the part of Lincoln and de Valera. For de Valera, as the 8th century, eighth century chronology suggests, Irish nationality stood outside historical time and constitutional form. The Declaration of Independence in 1916 had reasserted an existing nation rather than creating a new one. Ireland is more than a political union of states, de Valera told the American people in 1933. It has been a nation from the dawn of history, united in traditions, in political institutions, in territory. For Lincoln, by contrast, the American nation originated in the specific, concrete, and secular events of the American Revolution and rested on a shared commitment to abide by the principles of the Constitution. For our purposes today, however, the salient point um, is that both conceptions of nationality, the romantic and the constitutional, rendered secession or in the Irish idiom partition, impossible. Just conclude, um, my focus in this talk is on the 1880s and 1920s, um, conclude with stories of uh, two other uh, Irish visitors uh, to the United States. Um, the first being Sean T. O'Kelly, the Irish president in 1959, uh, who made a three-day ceremonial visit to Illinois in, in that year, where he visited uh, Lincoln's tomb and addressed the state legislature in Springfield. At the graveside, O'Kelly expressed his hope that the ancient notion of Ireland will be reunited peacefully in accordance with the democratic principles which that noble statesman 
fought for and died to uphold. In his speech to the legislature, O'Kelly expressed his wish to rededicate himself and the Irish people to the ideals Lincoln served so well and to the death, freedom, and unity. So once again, McSweeney uh, and de Valera, and in this case O'Kelly, juxtapose the terms freedom and unity, um, I think without regard to the different meanings of those terms in American history and in Irish history. And of course, this, is, this isn't unintentional. This is, this is quite um, deliberate. For O'Kelly, as for his Republican predecessors, freedom and unity amounted to the same thing, a single nationalist government for the island of Ireland. O'Kelly's main subject in his address was uh, partition, um, And again, uh, the, the, the line of argument is, uh, uh, is similar. Now, within 10 years of O'Kelly's visit to the United States, um, the evils that Eamon de Valera associated with secession uh, led to a civil war of sorts, uh, not between the two islands, as de Valera had predicted, but within the province of Northern Ireland. <coughs> Although this 30-year period of violence, uh, known to, the, to contemporaries as the Troubles, uh, raised perennial questions about union, it featured surprisingly few references to Abraham Lincoln. But as the conflict moved towards a resolution in the 1990s, images of Lincoln once again became more frequent in Irish political conversation with the most quoted words coming predictably from the second inaugural address. Dick Spring, the Irish Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs, cited the second inaugural address in 1993 to celebrate a breakthrough in the peace process known as the Downing Street Declaration, whereby the British and Irish governments recognized the right of the people of Northern Ireland to choose between union with Great Britain or a united Ireland. Likewise, the president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, meeting the Ulster Unionist leader, David Trimble, in public for the first time in September 1998, promised malice towards none as they strove to bind up the nation's wounds and move towards a just and lasting peace. Uh, Adams did not say which nation he had in mind the one whose wounds would be bound up, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, or a united Ireland. Uh, Trimble offered no public response to his counterpart's magnanimity. By 2009, the bicentennial year of Lincoln's birth, the prospects of lasting peace in Northern Ireland looked considerably better than a decade earlier, but there had been some ironic twists in Lincoln's path through Irish politics along the way. <coughs> When the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Peter Robinson, invoked Lincoln's image at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival here in Washington to celebrate the new Northern Ireland, he did so in a quite distinctive way. As I stand here and look towards the Lincoln Memorial, I'm reminded of the suffering that the United States experienced and the strong nation that emerged following its civil war, Robinson declared. Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's an important lesson for us all. Unlike his nationalist predecessors, however, Robinson was referring not to the United Island of Ireland, but instead to a self-governing Northern Ireland that would remain permanently a part of the United Kingdom. And that was the nation that, that would stand. Yet both parts of Ireland, like the remainder of the United Kingdom, were by now well-established parts of another union. Future debates on Irish sovereignty will concern the balance of power within Europe. How Abraham Lincoln will feature in these debates and in which of his various <coughs> forms, Republican, Democrat, Emancipator, wartime leader, Unionist, will depend on the issues at stake. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, if I could use the uh, chance here to ask the first question. You have quoted uh, Joseph Chamberlain and others saying that the Irish were unfit to uh, 
uh, govern themselves. I imagine that Abraham Lincoln was more optimistic, but it must have proved a real dilemma to him in any of his public utterances what exactly to say about the Irish question, knowing uh, that someone like Lloyd George or De Valera or even Jerry Adams would quote him. Uh, <laughs> so how did, uh, I, I'm a bit puzzled myself about uh, Lincoln's actual thoughts, as if we want the real uh, Lincoln on Ireland to actually stand up. So the, uh, will the real Abraham Lincoln please stand up? Um, the, the, um, the presentation I've, I've given you and the, uh, the contribution to the lar larger project of the global Lincoln, the, the, the focus there is on Lincoln's posthumous image. Um, so the larger um, work from, from which this is a part start, starts with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and how the Irish responded uh, to his assassination in, in 1865. Um, the unaddressed question in the paper is what did, the, what did Lincoln think of the Irish, uh, which is where I thought I would uh, start this uh, uh, project originally, and I, I've written um, other things about that. Um, he had an, an anti-Irish joke or two in his arsenal. Um, I'm not going to uh, share them. This, uh, uh, one, of the, one of them is pretty funny. Though. <laughs> um, um, he, uh, th th there, there are two, ar two areas in, w in which uh, he does have something to say. He doesn't have a great deal to say. Uh, just as I, I wouldn't want you to, to uh, leave today thinking that uh, Lincoln was a gigantic figure in Irish politics. Of course he wasn't. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, I didn't even know if anything could be written about him at all. But what you get is the occasional references to Lincoln allow you to reread political history and make it a little uh, less familiar in some ways. Uh, two areas in which he, he would have talked about the Irish, uh, one was nationalism and the other was nativism. Um, so uh, he has little to say on Irish nationalist uh, inspirations, uh, uh, aspirations, I should say, which are um, dictated largely by, by the growing presence of, of an Irish constituency in Illinois, uh, who, who's, some of whose vote he might get. Uh, they're, they're still going to uh, vote largely uh, uh, Democratic. So uh, he does sponsor some resolutions uh, uh, broadly in favor of, of uh, Hungarian and Irish um, nationalist aspirations, but without any intervention uh, by the United States in those affairs, so sort of hedging his bets. Um, I think uh, on nativism, which is uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, I mean, the bulk of anti-immigrant sentiment in the 1850s is directed at the Irish, so it's not simply anti-immigrant sentiment, it's uh, uh, anti-Irish because of their Catholicism, uh, uh, because of their poverty, because of their manners, because of their support for uh, slavery, or at least opposition to anti-slavery. Uh, Lincoln's position uh, on that question is circumspect and politically very adept, as, as you can imagine, which, which is that in private he is, he is uh, critical and contemptuous uh, of uh, nativism as a form of bigotry. And uh, in public, uh, he, his rhetoric is such that he is open to the possibility of know-nothings, nativists, uh, um, uh, supporting him because he needs their support if he's ever going to put together uh, a viable anti-slavery party. Uh, so not a great deal, uh, Roger, partly through circumspection and, and uh, partly for, for other reasons. Okay, let's open it up for questions and comments. Yeah, Jim? In if you can just introduce yourself, and please wait for the microphone. I have one suggestion and then a question. The suggestion is, have you used Flickr for your research? I have not. Um, I would strongly suggest it, yeah. uh, because there are tourists um, take pictures of Lincoln around the world. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you go to Flickr, you can see Lincoln in Mexico City. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating to see the ways in which Lincoln statues appear in various places. And then, in fact, you really see a global Lincoln because you then see the way in which tourists comment mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. seeing these statues around the world. Um, I guess, but I, what I'm curious about is, is where this goes. Um, 
it doesn't surprise me that any figure would be used malleably. Right? I mean, Lincoln is used in different parts of the world for different reasons, depending on what people need him for. So that would be what I would guess without doing any research at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious as to where this goes beyond that. Um, I was curious about this distinction between preserving union as a concept and preserving the union. Uh, that Lincoln, my guess is that Lincoln was not preserving union as a concept. He was preserving a very specific union that existed for a set of particular ideas and that he probably had no brief for the idea of union simply as, mm -hmm. a, as a concept, which is what was going on in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to where you play with that, and then just in general, where you go beyond just the sort of Lincoln is used malleably. Yeah, yeah. Um, just comment on a few of those. Uh, as, far, as far as images are, are concerned, Flickr, Flickr is a great idea. There, uh, other authors in this project have, have, have uh, looked a lot at the visual culture, but mainly from the 19th century and, and uh, early 20th. Um, the only... Um, image I used, and it, it didn't seem worth uh, having somebody set up a, uh, an AV and uh, PowerPoint uh, for this afternoon, was it, it, uh, t to my surprise in uh, brow brow browsing through the Irish Times, I think it was 1933 or 1934, um, I came across juxtaposed uh, busts of Abraham Lincoln and Eamon de Valera, um, and <coughs> with, with the caption, which I re reproduce uh, in the book, uh, uh, readers will notice the remarkable resemblance. Uh, There's very little resemblance. <laughs> and, uh, it, um, and then I, I riff a little bit on that. Uh, uh, Lady Gregory, uh, Yeats's confidant, had, had, had uh, uh, something to say in this matter as well. But it, that also addresses your point of, of what, what is this other than uh, um, malleability? Um, not a great deal. Uh, it m m might be the, the honest answer, but it, it, uh, it, it, there is some substance to that. Uh, wh one is, why is it Lincoln? Because the, the, only, the only other figure that, that, that comes up is Washington. And uh, Washington isn't as malleable. So what is it about Lincoln um, that allows him to um, the, the various figures that I've described here um, to be, say, in the English context, uh, to be celebrated by <coughs> abolitionists, by the working class, but also by Lloyd George or Churchill for, for completely different reasons as a wartime leader, to be uh, invoked in si analogous ways to what I've done here in India uh, by Gandhi when he's looking at uh, notions of democratic nationalism but not wartime leadership or by the, uh, by the leader of the Dalit or untouchable uh, movement who's looking at a different Lincoln, or why is it that the essay um, on uh, Spain, uh, in Spain he's a hero of the abolitionists in the 19th century and of the Franco right in, in, the, in, in the 20th century. Um, well, Lincoln confessed that the times made him. I, d I don't know that it's a great deal to do with, with Lincoln. You, you can enlighten me if you think it's Lincoln himself. Um, all, all of, the, whatever the reasons for that might be, right, there is no other American figure, uh, I believe, uh, uh, of, of, whom what I, of whom what I've just said is true. What it enables me to do in the Irish case is, as I said, to reread Irish political history and put a fresh twist on it. That's all I'm doing. I'm look at, looking at Irish history through uh, an unusual angle and uh, not at all, uh, I'm always acutely conscious that the uh, analogies literally between union are strained. Uh, I'm not looking for the veracity of Lincoln himself, but I am doing something, I think, uh, fresh and interesting with Irish history. The other pragmatic side of that is it, um, it can even open up new sources, uh, uh, which is something that is important to historians. One of the sources I used, which I never would have used as an Irish historian, uh, were State Department records uh, because the State Department published a compendium of reactions to Lincoln's assassination uh, around the world. And uh, what I found uh, uh, by it, just in, in, in small doses and little hints and clues were, was conceptions of Republican democracy. 
uh, coming through in mechanics and work, uh, workers' meetings and in municipal councils in Ireland, stuff I never would have looked at. So um, I think the claims are modest. There's a, there does seem to be an inherent fascination to Lincoln, and I don't know that I'm the one. It, it, we had a conference in Oxford about this uh, um, this very question you're, you're asking is, is what the conference was about and is what the book is about. Uh, um, and there's a talismanic uh, quality uh, that I don't think I can... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gandhi, the, in, oh, the, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, no, the interest in, in, in uh, the interest in India uh, also has to do with political martyrdom after Gandhi. So there's, there are just so many, so many strands of it that, that come out. Okay, um, yeah. yeah. Hold on. A wonderful presentation. Two brief comments. The first is that there was in the historical Lincoln this paradox of being the first leader of what had been a fairly radical party to head up the American government and pursuing a rebranding himself as a conservative and maintaining national union while a good part of his voting base he got 55% of the popular vote in the states in the north with a, um, a significant but hardly a majority of abolitionist support. So he, the historic Lincoln stride, was faced with the task of striding two horses at the same time and finally delay, having delayed the, the cause of abolition as long as he could felt he had to play that card in order to win the Civil War and paradoxically by playing the abolitionist card prevented European intervention in which might have cha changed the outcome. The other aspect that you've not mentioned is that once slavery was destroyed by the war and there was an, an Irish immigrant in the South who said that uh, recognized long just at the same time as emancipation, Patrick Cleburne in Tennessee that slavery had no future even if the South won the war, but once slavery was de and destroyed the, there was never again a serious movement towards secession in the South. You've got uh, Jim Crow as a kind of unfortunate example of home rule in the South lasting for several generations and that, in effect at the time when uh, the man you mentioned was giving his speeches in Illinois, but even that is gone. So uh, again, I, but Lincoln, his comments on the contemporary Irish situation were were few and I'm un unaware of any until you, you mm -hmm. brought them out, but mm -hmm. he did have Philip Sheridan who just burned up the Shenandoah Valley on, uh, for the north, and Patrick Cleburne, another key Irish immigrant in the south. Well, I'll take them more as, as comments than as questions, so th uh, thank you. Um, the, the, the one thing that does strike me in the Irish case is the, the absence of slavery from the, uh, I mean, there are multiple multiple global Lincolns, and it, it, as I mentioned in, in the in 19th century Spain, he's an inspiration to nationalists he's in England and in Wales, the, the anti-slavery or abolitionist theme comes through. In the Irish case, it's a very strained analogy between emancipation and national liberation. Uh, and so when de Valera and O'Kelly praise him as the liberator of a, of a race, they've rather uh, distorted the, the original, but they know they're doing that, and that's that's the particular invocation. Thanks for your presentation. I have a question about the, uh, did, the did the many Irish uh, immigrants who fought in the Civil War have an impact on how then Lincoln was remembered in Ireland, whether they were, I know that many Fenians fought for the, for the Union and then, and then as skirmishers actually brought back some of their their skills to Ireland, and that's just one example. Is there a sense of a kind of a, a real Irish, a, an imaginary connection, but also a real connection between Ireland and Irish national liberation struggles? And, and, and yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, so, so did the the Irish who, who fought in the Civil War did they have uh, an impact on the um, image of Lincoln in Ireland uh, to the extent that they? were involved then in Irish nationalist affairs as Fenians or in small numbers as return migrants. Uh, not that I came across. Uh, it, it's conceivable that, th that they, they would have. Uh, one of the things, and again, it's not part of today's presentation, but it, it does fall under the heading of Lincoln and the Irish. Um, I mean, there's a body of, of historical literature that suggests that Irish um, 
military service during the war uh, um, was very important in establishing uh, Irish-American bona fides for citizenship. Um, and um, I've never quite understood what that claim means, uh, unless it's meant in, in, a, in a, a sort of a generic and general way where citizenship means respectability, where, where any doubts about your, your suitability to become a citizen um, are, are finally allayed by, by the fact that you fight for your country. Uh, because wh when, you, when you look at Lincoln, it's, cl it's clear that Lincoln did have uh, doubts about the suitability of African Americans for citizenship. Um, abolition came late. Uh, it's also clear that, that African American military service uh, was important uh, in, in the evolution of his thinking. Um, and I guess some historians of Irish America would sort of like to think the same about the Irish, but I, I haven't found that in the research I've done. What, what, what I see is, is, I don't think Lincoln ever had any doubts uh, that European immigrants were um, fully entitled to citizenship and, and, his, and its uh, benefits. It's, it's not the question you asked me, but it's, it's an interesting uh, subset. Uh, and I, I think his, his uh, position of this was circumspect in public and, and very clear in, in his private correspondence. Okay. Um, back in the Dark Ages, I wrote a dissertation about John Hay, who was his secretary, as you pointed out, and um, Hay, Hay was very liberal in his views of most people, but he had two people that he didn't like. He didn't like the Irish and he didn't like the Mormons for various reasons. And I think that his anti-Irish uh, sentiments were stoked largely during the war, uh, probably because of the civil, um, the, the resistance to the draft that uh, Irish people were thought to be prominent in. And I don't know whether that, you know, carried over to Lincoln and whether he felt the same way and uh, whether uh, there was an interaction between Hay and Lincoln on that point. I don't, I don't know if there was an interaction between uh, uh, Hay and Lincoln, but w one, of the thing, one of the places where I thought I would find Lincoln talking about the Irish and possibly his dislike of them is, is around the draft riots. But uh, in any research I've done, I've never found uh, him saying anything on the draft riots. I don't, I don't, uh, Tyler, you, you might know better than I do, but, but I looked fairly closely and, and uh, again, uh, my, my my sense of Lincoln is, is that he, he, he really uh, did not like bigots, and he 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 did believe believe in in, in certain um, fundamental rights, and he to which uh, I don't think he ever doubted that European immigrants were in, entitled uh, to them. And I I think I mean the vaguest, in some ways, the most interesting claim. I could make about Lincoln and immigration is that he thought it mattered uh, how, how the country treated its immigrants. So leaving aside the question of, of westward expansion or, or a free labor ideology or any of that, 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 that that's some fundamental part of his democratic uh, creed was um, um, it, there's a consistency in, in his dislike for bigotry which also explains why he didn't later have to be convinced that, oh yeah, after all, the Irish are uh, uh, capable of being good citizens. I don't th think he doubted that they were. He had no reason to like them. I mean, they, they voted uh, against him. They voted early and they voted often in <laughs> Illinois. The, they were shipped around the state on railroads. To, uh, to, he knew that, he, he talks about that. Uh, but I mean, there's a deeper principle at stake here. Um, all right, all the way in the back here. Um, Al Milliken, uh, in the course of your research, did you come across any surprises in the American uh, culture and society as a whole on how they were changing in any respects regarding uh, discrimination against the most recent Irish immigrants? And uh, what distinction do you think that was made uh, that drawn between the Irish and uh, those that labeled themselves the Scotch Irish? Uh, surprises in, in uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm right on Lincoln. If I am, I was pleasantly surprised by what I just <laughs> just said uh, there. Uh, the, the, 
the Scots Irish Irish one is, is is an interesting one. It doesn't come into this immediate uh, story, except in insofar as nativism uh, does. And uh, the, um, the the Scots Irish were Irish people of of Ulster, usually Presbyterian origin. Uh, so if you, if you had uh, looked for Irish America in the 18th century, uh, it these are the people you would have been talking about, and you would have found them primarily in Pennsylvania and points south. Um, and you would have uh, found uh, people uh, complaining about them in, in terminology that later became familiar in the 19th century, uh, uh, complaining about their, their morals, their manners, not, not perhaps uh, as extremely as Cotton Mather in, in 1700 when he described the arrival of the Scots-Irish in Boston as the formidable attempts of Satan and his sons to unsettle us. Uh, but the Scots-Irish didn't stay in, in Boston. <laughs> Understandably, they, uh, they moved south. Uh, the term Scots-Irish uh, is it's a, an ethnic neologism of the 19th century. They didn't call themselves the Scots-Irish in the 18th century. They didn't need to because they didn't need to distinguish themselves from others. Uh, so there's some sense that the term was used of them and used uh, uh, pejoratively uh, in, the, in the 18th century, but it was appropriated as a term in the 19th century to distinguish themselves from the Irish they did not uh, want to be associated with. And in the 1830s and 1840s, the Scots-Irish, um, to the extent that they're involved in nativism, would, would be more as perpetrators than as, as targets. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Hi, um, I was just wondering maybe a bit more about martyrdom and um, in the in the U.S. Uh, many of the kind of wives and, and mothers of the the men of the Easter Rising who were you know killed for treason come and tour the U.S. to raise money for Republican causes and if if they kind of are they're using the language of blood sacrifice and are they kind of making parallels between um, the kind of founding generation and United States and, and their own relatives? Uh, that, that's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, 1916 is, is a blood sacrifice uh, in, in that the, the leaders of the insurrection know that uh, they're going to kill people and probably be executed. Um, and they see some redemptive power in that, which is why the timing, it's time for Easter Sunday, and it takes place on Easter Monday. Uh, no, uh, Megan, I would say, it, it, in terms of the sources, I've, I've, I've never seen that. I've never seen an association between that cult of martyrdom and the martyrdom of, of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but I did see, and I mentioned um, the larger um, research for this be, uh, begins with responses to um, Lincoln's assassination, uh, his political martyrdom, if you like, in, in 1865. What comes through very strongly in that, and I mentioned that there are clues to conceptions of Irish Republican democracy, is, is a sense that um, it's, it is a tragedy, but he has achieved his aims. Uh, interestingly, it, it, it's the one area where slavery is a theme because it doesn't become a theme in the memory, but in 1865 people say, this is a tragedy, but he has achieved his aims, he has saved the Union, he has freed the slaves. Um, and um, it is a tragedy, but this is uh, a Republican democracy, and it will survive. It will survive the assassination of its uh, um, executive. And they draw analogies with European monarchies where that would not happen. So they say that the, 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 the um, country has generated the leader rather than the other way around, rather than the leader generating the country. And, 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 and the, the refrain in, in these obscure little town hall meeting, or municipal uh, meetings and um, uh, workers' meetings is, is, is that, yes, uh, this is terrible, uh, but it will survive. And if this happened in France or Russia, the polity would not survive because it would crumble with the death. So, and th that, that I thought was quite interesting and unexpected. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. 
hope this isn't too much off the subject, um, but there's an important case going on right now that I, um, I put material in a file called Boston Legal, um, but um, it is the, uh, the oral history case that involves an archive at Boston College and contemporary Irish politics, and I just wonder, do you have any interesting insights to give us? I, uh, I wish I did. Um, that I can tell you um, I had no involvement in... in <laughs> no, 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 and that, sound, that sounds funny, but uh, alas, that's the, the point to be emphasized, that uh, I had no involvement in that project, and neither did any other historian, with one exception, uh, at my university, in my department, or in my college. Could, could you for not everybody here might know about this this uh, issue, so if you can just, one of you, just explain real quick what we're talking about. Well, Arnita, please explain. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is a case um, where uh, oral histories were done um, on people who were involved in the Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland, and, um, you know, the subjects um, were told in good faith that the material would be uh, in an archive and I think not opened until they were gone, um, until they, were, they had died. Um, but there is a court proceeding now in, I in Northern Ireland that um, has insisted that uh, these documents are relevant and they need to be opened and um, they have been subpoenaed from, and I, I can't speak to the international traffic that's gone on that makes this possible, but they are, um, um, they have been subpoenaed and Boston College, I believe, is saying it will hand them over at this point. They were, they were told today that they had to hand oh. over more than they thought. Okay. But the other part is that one of the people who participated in the oral histories published a book where he used them. And if you don't know that, then there's a big piece that you're missing because they were in fact used by one person, and so that's that's how the Brits found out what was in them. All right. They didn't name names that violated the agreement. Okay. Very good. Um, anything else? If not, then I think I yeah one. No question. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Um, no question. Okay. Then. Another you, question. Did one you question. have a question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is a little bit off the topic, too, but a comment that you made about the figure of George Washington. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, in light of uh, the nationalist goals, Washington, it would seem to me, would be you know, rebel against the Brits, would be a much more applicable figure. Did you run across any, um, when you were looking at Lincoln, did people also refer to Washington, or is it just a empty? Yeah, uh, some questions about, about Washington. and. and I did, and routinely I ran across uh, uh, the following formulation, which, which is uh, no, no other figure with the possible exception of George Washington and, um, can, can uh, you know, have this degree of meaning for us or can symbolize this or can symbolize that. So Washington is mentioned, usually in a subclause uh, uh, alongside Lincoln. Uh, but, I mean, I would say that um, it, he's the only other figure who 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 gets that degree of attention? I'd, and but the point you pick up on is is a good one. Um, I mean, part of the uh, Irish American claim uh, in the 19th century to, uh, to be good, loyal Americans is, is that we share a tradition that comes out of George Washington, the one that you've just suggested. But I don't see Washington having the malleability or the utility in a range of uh, political situations globally that for whatever reason the protean uh, uh, Lincoln seems to have. Okay. Yeah. Final question. One thought on that is Lincoln could write. Uh, Lincoln could write. Lincoln so could that's write. probably a big difference. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, yeah let me just yeah, put something yeah. on because uh, uh, it occurred to me it might be some other people that could help me. I'm, I'm writing a trilogy about the Irish in Washington. I've got, I'm working on the third book. Uh, actually, the Irish in America. Uh, and as I've gotten in the, the periods, uh, 36 back to the, to, the, to, the, to the famine, 1968, and now I'm working on 1993, and there's a structure here. 
Uh, it's occurred to me in the last two or three months that the Irish uh, migration, the famine migration, was a unique historical event. And what I'm trying to get on that, if anybody has any thoughts on that, I, I want to talk about it. And what I'd like, to, uh, the, the, the context I have is that uh, there were so many of them in such a shot and under such incredible circumstances uh, that they never went back. It which just occurred to me about the Civil War. They didn't go back. They, they left. There was no food. They were never going back. 90, the numbers are 90 to 95 percent of the Irish stayed and never went back. Mediterraneans were, you know, 45, 50, a lot of, a lot of Italians and others. They came over here to make money to go back and live. So the fact, th that's what I'd like to talk with you about, if I could, because you talk about the Atlantic migration, so I'd uh, like to yeah. remind you that. Does anybody else here, because you're going to be here, you're going back to Boston, does <laughs> anybody else here know anything about that? Yeah, it's, it would be lower than, that, that rate of return would be Jim, hold on. higher. That rate of return would be higher than Jews, Russian Jews. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, now, the point is, is that, and the track of my thing, and is that we are no longer Irish Americans, that we are integral to the fabric of the current American persona. All right, that, that the, and that's why that this is all happenstance at the end of this thing. But by the time you get to 93, the characters I'm writing about have no context of discrimination they think is ludicrous. Some person is called the Mick, he can't, he can't even understand the poverty of the mind of the person who calls him a Mick. So, uh, I think it's a very interesting, I, I think it's unique, I don't know. Um, well, we can, we can certainly talk, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. The, the, um, uh, I mean, as far as you know, the rates of return migration are very low. They may not be quite as low as, we, as we've always assumed them to be because not enough work has been done on it, but, but uh, 5% uh, or something like that is, is the figure that, that's usually used compared to, to up to 65% of, of Slavs and 50% of Italians at the turn of the 20th century or, or more than that. Uh, so certainly uh, very low rates of return migration, though some work, if it were done, could, could discover that the rate was a little higher and still wouldn't be very high. Um, the John Mitchell, um, the Irish nationalist exile who, who settled in, in New York and then in Tennessee and was pro-slavery, pro-Confederate. Um, it's a famous quote from, from him uh, about the famine. Um, uh, the, the Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. Uh, that, if you like, is the, it's the bedrock, possibly the foundational myth of Irish-American Ethnic identity. I mean, myth in a, not in a necessarily pejorative way. Foundational belief. Um, it's not a view that that many historians hold to. If it's equated with a, a charge of of genocide, so um, you have to be careful with it. And we, but but the one thing I will say is because uh, I'm working on this book on diaspora, diaspora at the moment and um, return is the negation of diaspora. If everybody returns, you'll have no diaspora left. So if you believe that you're in exile and you've been banished, then uh, that belief uh, can be nurtured and cherished and sustained uh, if you return in very low numbers. But if you all returned, then that belief would go away. <laughs> um, so, but we'll, let's talk more about, about that after. after uh, okay, I think there'll be, a, a, as usual, a, a, <clears throat> a small reception outside to which I'd like to invite you, but not before uh, asking you to join me in a round of applause for Professor Kenny.